We're in a series called Psalm Sundays. I'm looking at psalms that are either quoted by Jesus in the New Testament, since Psalms was his favorite book to quote, or that are messianic in nature. Today we're in Psalm 118. So please open your Bibles there or navigate on your device so you can follow along. Psalm 118 is our text. The topic... The congregation of Israel participates in worship by singing antiphonally at their celebration of Passover. The title of our message, I've just had an antiphony. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for letting us be here today. We're here by your invitation. Whatever other uh, motive we may have or a motivation we may think we have, uh, Lord, you've invited us here. We are your guests. We desire to learn from you and hear from you and be touched by your spirit. We want to know, Lord, that uh, you are ministering to your saints here in this place. Individually, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit, but we're also collectively that temple on earth. That means you are here in a special way, like you mentioned in the book of the Revelation, walking among the candlesticks. And so, Lord, make yourself known to us through the word. We pray in Jesus' name and those who agreed said, amen. If you have a Roman Catholic heritage, you will know how to respond to this. Are you ready? The Lord be with you. All right. Who said, and also with you, raise your hand. And did anybody say, and with your spirit? Yeah, got one. They made the change from, and also with you, to, and with your spirit, around 2008. I'm guessing that there was, and still is, a lot of confusion in the pews. Lapsed Catholics who find themselves at a mass for a funeral or a wedding are going to be confused for sure. While everybody's saying one thing, they're saying the other. So probably were some priesters. They're the folks who only attend twice a year on Christmas and Easter. Priesters. I guess there could be Protestant priesters as well. They're also called by some CEOs, Christmas, Easter only. Shame on you for laughing. At least they come... (laughs) At least they come twice a year. This kind of participation by the congregation is technically called either responsorial or antiphonal. It's responsorial when each statement is followed by a response from the congregation. It's antiphonal when it is spoken or sang alternately. I actually get confused on the precise use of each word. So let's just say that there is a participatory response from the congregation. In Psalm 118... We find participatory responses for the congregation of Israel on their annual feast day of Passover. One of the first response passages is in verse 2, 3, and 4. Someone invited a response asking them to now say, and then three different groups in the assembly answered. I'll read it to you. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. His mercy endures forever is in verse 1 as well. And it ends the psalm in verse 29. And so obviously we would do well to focus on mercy as we enjoy this psalm. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, mercy forever is God's promise to you. And number two, mercy forever is God's plan for you. Mercy forever is God's promise to you. That's in verses 1 through 13. Uh, There's going to be several passages in Psalm 118 that are lifted directly from the book of Exodus. The Israelites would recognize this immediately as a Passover psalm. One scholar notes, and I quote, verse 14 quotes Exodus 5, verse 2, and this repeated right hand in verses 15 through 16 matches the three occurrences in Exodus 15, 6, and 12. Not surprisingly, in this regard, Psalm 118 includes uh, concludes, excuse me, the Hallel Psalms, Psalm 113 to 118, which is used at Passover, a celebration that recalls and recounts the deliverance from Egypt. And so we're on good ground to say this is a Passover song. Now, we don't annually celebrate Passover. The Apostle Paul told us that in the church age in which we live, Jesus himself is our Passover. And the Passover symbolism was all fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He was the final Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, some of you, I have as well, you may have been to a Passover Seder 
Uh, Seder just means order or liturgy, I'm pretty sure. And so you can go to a Jewish synagogue, or a lot of churches put this on. Uh, there's different people who travel around, and they put on a Passover Seder. And they do all of this stuff uh, to show you the symbolism of Passover. Uh, that's fine. The only thing you need to know is all of that stuff came out of the third century. It was added to the Jewish Passover celebration way after Jesus. Jesus did not celebrate Passover the way Passover seders go today. The Passover of Jesus, you can read about it in the uh, gospel accounts, very simple. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, this uh, symbol-filled ceremony as we think. In fact, sometimes I think those symbols take away from Jesus himself just saying, this is my body and this is my blood. But Nothing wrong with going to a Seder, but there is something wrong with people telling you you must celebrate the Passover in order to really understand your Christian roots in Hebrewism. That's all done. I don't want to go back to something that didn't work in the first place, uh, or that was temporary, I should say. I want to stay with what is permanent. Verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Obviously responsive, each sentence spoken or sang by different people. The entire psalm is responsive, drawing the congregation into the celebration. Think of it as we go through this, thousands of people responding on this celebration day with music playing and, and uh, all in harmony, all in one. You could spend a long time thinking about how the Lord was merciful to Israel throughout their history. The Exodus could have as a subtitle, God's Marvelous Manifold Mercies in the Wilderness. Though the Israelites rebelled over and over and over again, though they ultimately refused to go into the promised land, God nevertheless preserved them in his mercy. And now see how far they'd come. Here they were worshiping in the temple, keeping the Passover as prescribed, and doing it joyfully. If you're just reading Exodus, and you get to the part where they say, we're not going into the land because there are giants in there, and they refuse to go in, you're thinking, hey, these people, this nation will never make it to the place where God wants them to be. They'll never get into the land. They'll never have their own temple. And yet, through his mercy, episode after episode, he provides for them and he brought them to this point and they celebrate. And by the way, God's mercy towards the nation of Israel in the past, that would guarantee that he's going to be merciful to them in the future. He's not suddenly going to turn his back on Israel. Uh, scripture says he won't, but, but just knowing the nature and character of God, you know that that's not possible. God has made too many unconditional promises to the nation of Israel, to the physical descendants of Abraham, in order to just turn his back on them. And so uh, we see Israel in the land today. Uh, that, there's a prophecy update for you, and that is a fulfillment of prophecy, many Old Testament prophecies. People say sometimes, oh, if I could see a miracle, I'd believe in God. Israel, look to the Middle East. Israel is a miracle. It is a modern-day miracle. It is the fulfillment of many prophecies. And so uh, God still working with his forever people. Verse 2, let Israel now say his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say his mercy endures forever. Let's have a little fun. I'll be the soloist, and you will respond his mercy endures forever. Okay, you ready? Say it, let's say it through one time because I know it's hard to remember. His mercy endures forever. Got it? Okay. Now let the women say. His mercy endures forever. Now let the men say. His mercy endures forever. Now let everybody say. His mercy endures forever. This is better than first service. <laughs> I think we still have a long ways to go. So I always trip people out. They say, well, why don't you take it out then? Because when I do weddings, I always do with uh, this ring, IV wed. And it just, that one phrase really stumbles people. The with and maybe, blah, 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 blah. I like it. So. <laughs> so there were three groups present, the Israelites by birth, the priests, and then non-Jews, God-fearers. These are non-Jewish believers. Salvation was exclusively through the nation of Israel. But anyone could be saved who came to God in that prescribed way. In his mercy, God has always made a way for anyone, anywhere to be saved. Today, that way is Jesus. It is an exclusive way. It is the way and the truth and the life. 
There's no other way to the Father. And if you understand the problem of sin and the need to be declared righteous, you understand that there could be no other way. Buddha can't get there. Muhammad can't get there. Confucius say, but he can't get there. None of that will work. It doesn't solve the problem of sin uh, and justification by faith. And and so uh, it's exclusive, but everyone is invited. Jesus is the savior of the whole world, especially those who believe. So the leader, let's call him the soloist, would sing verses 5 through 9 entirely. I called on the Lord in distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do. The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. Time and again, after Israel rebelled, the Lord would hear their cries, and in his mercy, he would restore them. When they returned to him and trusted in the Lord, there was a godly confidence that they could not be defeated. Imagine that. Uh, as they did go in to conquer the promised land, there was, they couldn't be defeated except by themselves or trusting in man. And they learned that lesson early on. But otherwise, it didn't matter the size of the army or the size of the men, uh, the weaponry. Nothing mattered because God went before them. They could only be defeated by themselves, actually, and by drifting away from God, they often earned his discipline. We, too, can be our own worst enemy if we grow apathetic and set ourselves adrift. With COVID-19 still affecting churches negatively, it's an especially dangerous time. Now, I want to be careful throughout. If you stay home and watch worship online and hear the Bible study, or if you want to wear a mask or uh, whatever your response is, well, that's your response and that's your business. I don't consider reckless people any more spiritual than people who are overly cautious. Everybody has their own response. We've told you what we're going to do, and then you do what you want to do. And so my next few comments, they're not addressed at people who refuse to come to church. Uh, it's, it, the, uh, but I think you'd have to say that the church is weakened right now, not strengthened. Most Christians who could return to church are not returning to church. Most churches that could be open are not yet reopening. Most Christians who were watching online are no longer doing that. And I know that going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Uh, But (laughs) church is important. Christians were made to fellowship with each other. And there is a sense of the real presence of Jesus ministering to his people when we gather together. This is not a time to be weakened. We've got the stress from the disease and now unrest in all of the nation and maybe all over the world. Uh, We're the only answer. We've got the only voice uh, and, and the church is being weakened. Many pulpits are turning to a social gospel rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. We would call that another gospel, uh, a false gospel. It's the, you know, the doctrine of demons. We're here to preach the gospel. Because in the end, I don't care what you think of rioters or protesters or COVID-19, the problem of the heart is the problem. And so what we need to do is change lives, and no one can change life except for Jesus Christ. And so that's our mission. And we can't afford to be backpedaling right now. We need to stand up and be the church. Verse 8, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Do we ever put confidence in man? Well, this would be confidence in things other than the Lord and in his wisdom where he has clearly spoken. And the answer is sure we do. That's because we remain in our unredeemed human bodies with a propensity to sin. Our minds are not totally renewed. At least mine isn't. Yours might be. I don't think so. We don't always set our affections on things above. As far as putting our confidence in man, Christians and churches often adopt worldly methods I would throw out there something we'd all be touched by, and that is fundraising. Churches are known, noted, and hated for their fundraising efforts. Uh, People think it's just par for the course. And uh, we get people, literature comes all the time. These organizations say, hey, we can help you raise money. And they guarantee if you use their method that tithing will go up a certain percentage. Well, how can they... How can they guarantee what they don't know about because the Holy Spirit hasn't revealed it to them? Because it's a technique, it's a pressure, it's a manipulation. 
we could get more money easily. But we have a saying around here, Chuck Smith coined it, where God guides, God provides. Sometimes you don't know if God is guiding if he's not the one providing. I know a lot of people who've gotten in way over their heads on building projects uh, because they pressed forward where God wasn't really providing. They thought, you know, the classic one is that people always think once you build your own nice building, more people will come to your church. And that is almost never true. What actually happens is less people come to your church because some of the people in your church don't want to meet in a building or they like the building that they're in or that kind of thing. So we want to be guided by God. Do we ever put confidence in princes? And I would take that to mean government or other leaders. And sure we do. The U.S. Supreme Court recently astonished us. Those princes ruled that the 1964 Civil Rights Act protects gay, lesbian, and transgender employees from discrimination based on sex. The ruling was six to three with Justice Neil Gorsuch, President Trump's first appointee to the court, writing the majority opinion. The opinion was joined by Chief Justice John Roberts and the court's four liberal justices. In an article titled Gorsuch versus Gorsuch, the Wall Street Journal, not necessarily a spiritual publication, noted, and I quote, an alien legal being seems to have taken over Justice Gorsuch. That might be true. Remember, I think last week or a couple of weeks ago, we talked about uh, the unseen realm and how there are demonic entities and spiritual powers that are warring uh, for the control of governments. And with some of the things going on in our country right now, you look at them and you think, that's insane, that's irrational, that's illogical. What are they thinking? I have to chalk one up for the devil. I think he's got people so twisted they can't understand even how to you know, do a two plus two anymore. I'm anxious to see what happens in Minneapolis without a police department. That's, uh, I can tell you what that's going to be like. It, it, it should be... If you and I were in Minneapolis, we should be on the freeway out to the next nearest state because they must get thousands of calls for service every day. Imagine calling 911 with a real emergency and not being able to get a hold of a police officer. And, and think of our poor cops. We, you, you know, we really need to pray for all of our emergency people, but right now, this has nothing to do with the study, this is just a personal thing because I've been a chaplain for so many years. The number one danger, the number one problem in law enforcement is suicide. More officers kill themselves every year than are killed in the line of duty or that have heart attacks or any of those other things. Stress is the big problem and suicide is, is its result. Imagine having all that stress already, now being out there where people general, you have a general feeling that people hate you and that every contact with the public not, is, it not only is just that it's on film, but is a potential national situation. I don't know how you guys do it that are in law enforcement. So we're praying for you. We love you. I'm pretty sure that the writer of uh, the Wall Street Journal meant it as sarcasm, but I wouldn't be so sure because it makes no sense. Verses 10 through 13, also responsive. All nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me. Yes, they just surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They surrounded me like bees. They were quenched like a fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Just imagine that. The soloists barking out and then the people going, in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Louder and louder each time with music. And oh, man, this is fantastic. Three times the congregation exclaimed this. His name isn't a magic word that defeats our foes. We don't need to repeat it over and over again uh, to get a result. I was in, a, in the Philippines one time with uh, some Pentecostal brethren, wonderful people, uh, and uh, we were getting ready to do some kind of a ministry. I forget what it was, but four or five of us were in the back, and they say, hey, well, let's pray, you know, let's pray before this thing. And they said, Gene, you know, why don't you pray? And I was blessed, and so I said, well, okay, let's pray, and I bowed my head to start, and all of a sudden, this guy next to me, right in my ear, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I thought, okay, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Then his buddy, holy God, holy God, holy God, 
Holy God, holy God. Now, I was going to do an experiment, but I'll pass. But imagine one of those guys on either side of you. I, I literally could not get words out of my mouth. I, I, I just, I don't know what I said. It, it was probably tongues to them. <laughs> You want to teach somebody how to speak in tongues, just get one guy on one side saying Jesus and another guy saying Holy God, and you, you just can't formulate words. And so I don't know, you know, you, you don't do that at home. Do you do that at home? You say, Pam, 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 Pam. <laughs> and Pam says, I heard you the first time. Yeah. <laughs> What's all this repetition? <laughs> Crazy. We don't say Abraka Jesus, so that's not the idea. In the name of the Lord means that we have his authority. We represent him. We act on his behalf. Acting on his behalf can get us imprisoned or martyred, but that's never a defeat. It's a W in the cosmic struggle against God's enemies. What can man do to me? The worst thing somebody can do to you is kill you, and that's the, really the best thing they could do. I mean, not that we long for death or wish for it, but even Paul the Apostle, he kind of did. He said, hey, I'd rather be in heaven. It's, I don't want to complain, but getting stoned all the time and being beaten and how many shipwrecks do I really need, Lord, to, you know, to, to make this thing work? Uh, and he said, but, you know, if the Lord wants me to stay, I'll stay and I'll serve him. And so uh, it's always a W for us. Now, we just read these verses. Can you think of any time in Israel's history that these words might describe? For example, all nations surrounding Israel. Well, the only thing I can suggest for our consideration is that this is future history. If you approach this passage with the great tribulation in mind, it makes more sense. And people say, well, wait a minute. The, the writer didn't know anything about Israel's future history. You know who did? The Holy Spirit who inspired this. Peter tells us in the New Testament that some of these prophets and writers didn't know what they were writing. That makes sense if you're writing the, uh, under the inspiration of God. And so this is looking at the future and maybe specifically the second coming when Jesus will be surrounded at Armageddon, but will easily defeat the nations of the world gathered there. The tribulation itself is mercy, albeit a severe mercy. By it, God offers those on earth salvation in Jesus, not willing that any should perish, but rather that they would receive eternal life. You need to read the Bible from the point of view of grace, that God is gracious, that God is merciful. And when you approach a, a book like Revelation, where there's meteors falling out of the sky, wormwood is coming, people are being slain left and right, water's poisoned, all the vegetation, this kind of thing, you can still read it from a point of view of mercy and think, how is God merciful in doing this? Well, he's merciful because it's a last call to salvation. He's got to wrap this thing up. We can't go on the way the world is today. There's a glorious plan for the future. You read about it at the end of Revelation. And God's going to wrap it up. And so he's going to accelerate the gospel by saying, here's what's going to happen. There's destruction like you've never seen before coming. Turn to the Lord. How will they know? There'll be 144,000 witnesses. There'll be two amazing witnesses doing miracles. An angel will be flying through the sky preaching the gospel during the tribulation. It is God's severe mercy. It's not out of anger. It's out of wrath, which is not anger. And it's God drawing people to himself. And a lot of people will get saved in the great tribulation. It'll be a tough time to be saved, though, because you'll probably most likely be martyred. Verse 13, you pushed me violently that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The picture here is of someone being pushed off the edge of a cliff. No matter how violent the pushing throughout history, Israel still stands. You ever use the expression pushback? It's used when you've had it with some policy or practice, and so you begin to push back instead of simply accepting it. In a sense, the great tribulation is God's pushback against sinners. But always remember, it is a measured pushback because God also extends mercy to save. Our second point, mercy forever is God's plan for you. Incidentally, Psalm 118 was Martin Luther's favorite. He called it my own beloved psalm. Luther considered verse 17 to be a masterpiece, and he asserted that all the saints have sung this verse and will continue to sing it to the end. If the songs we sing are any indication, the church likes Psalm 118, Hymns and choruses and performance songs based on it abound. You'll for sure recognize three of them. 
verse 14, verse 19, and verse 24. Remember verse 14? The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. It's kind of a dirge, but it's fun. <laughs> the Lord is my strength, my son. No, that's not it. Wrong one. All right, forget that. It was going to be a big moment and I blew it. People are looking for some kind of strength. Trouble is, they're mostly looking within themselves by listening to so-called self-appointed experts. I know that because the self-help industry is an $11 billion a year industry. Your life coach, if you have a life coach, God bless you. I don't know it, so I'm not talking about you, but if you have a life coach, they have no licensing, no training, no certification. For all you know, there are drunken stoners at home, and that's why they're in such a good mood. Ask them why they're so hungry all the time. <laughs> My solution is snacking. Lots of snacking will keep you happy. But no, seriously, people want help. They want to be strong human beings. And so God says, turn to my son, Jesus Christ. I will declare you righteous. You'll have standing with me. And I will give you the promise of God, the Holy Spirit, a power that raised Christ from the dead can dwell within you and sustain you and strengthen you on into eternity. Yeah, not so much. I'd rather practice Eckhart, Tollhart's, you know, stuff or whatever it be. And so... We're looking for strength in all the wrong places. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Valiantly could also be translated is victorious. We know from the complete revelation of the word of God that Jesus ascended and sits at the right hand of God. He was victorious over Satan and sin and death. That is real strength. And the song he sings is the wooing of the Holy Spirit. You want to have real strength? Be a person that is no longer afraid of anything except the Lord. Uh, and as I said earlier, the worst thing that could happen to you is that somebody would kill you. You think, well, wow, go for it. Because uh, to be absent from my body is to be present with the Lord. Verse 17, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Israel as a nation endured much disciplining by God for her many willful failures. Yet God did not destroy his chosen nation. They endured in his mercy. They endure today in his mercy. God's merciful today to Israel in that he's brought them back into their land. And they're still in an unbelieving state. They don't even believe in Jesus. I mean, there's, Christ, there's Jews who believe in Christ, obviously. But they're not a Christian nation. Would you say Israel is a Christian nation? They just passed some laws not too long ago, uh, or a declaration saying they are a Jewish nation. Uh, I mean, you know, you can't put yourself in the place of God, but you think, all right, come on, guys. I know it's been rough, this diaspora for centuries, but you're in your land again and it's thriving. Turn to me. God's merciful. He'll bring them to himself through the great tribulation. Verse 19. Open unto me the gates of righteousness. I will go through them and I will praise the Lord. That's how it should go. Worship guys. Sorry. <laughs> this is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you for you have answered me and have become my salvation. There's a wrong way of reading this. It's not saying that you must be self-righteous to enter God's presence. The soloist isn't saying who among you is righteous enough to come in. He's saying all the righteous come in. Who are the righteous? They are those who are declared righteous by God. He declares believing sinners righteous. He justifies them. It's as if they never sinned because of the work of Jesus Christ. He becomes your salvation when you receive him as your substitute on the cross. I wish I'd come across this Charles Spurgeon quote years ago. I used it, I think, last week. You'll hear it a lot. I'm thinking about just saying it at the end of every message. It's so profound. He said, you stand before God as if you were Jesus because Jesus stood before God as if he were you. What a neat way of talking about just the simplicity of Jesus taking our place. Jesus says, hey, Gene, you can't stand before God, but I can. So let me take your place before God. Let me take the wrath of sin upon myself 
so that God can be just in justifying you. You're still a sinner. You know, I got saved uh, one day in 1979, and a minute after I was saved, I was just as unrighteous outwardly as I had ever been, but I had been declared righteous in heaven. And I was uh, in the place of standing where when God looked at me, he saw his son Jesus taking my place. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, marvelous in our eyes. Jesus is the foundation upon which God's household of faith must be built. When he came the first time, the leaders of Israel, who are the builders, rejected him. Today, he's the foundation of the church, built upon by the apostles and prophets of the first century. He will yet become the chief cornerstone of Israel as they go through the great tribulation and are brought to salvation. Verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice. And be glad in it. And be glad in it. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. And Jesus is the way. No, so. <laughs> Camp time. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. We recognize this from the description of Palm Sunday given in the Gospels. The day had come, but the Jews refused to recognize their Messiah, plunging them into another time of discipline. God is the Lord, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. Remember, it was Passover. It's a Passover psalm. The procession had arrived at the altar of sacrifice. It was time to kill the sacrificial lamb. Lamb after lamb after lamb was slain. Do you ever, are you the kind of person that when you hear, hear things on television, you try and work it out? So like, the, I, I wish I had a specific example, but I don't want to offend anybody. But sometimes they say every 10 seconds, uh, somebody is killed doing something. Or every 15 minutes this happens or that. You think, okay, wait a minute. If that's true, then every minute, every hour, every day, you end up with a, it's like playing checkers and doubling it every time. You end up with more people than ever existed. And so I don't know why they make up these, it offends me when they make up numbers. So what does this have to do with this? Well, there are incredible estimates of how many lambs were slain annually at the second temple period. One, a lot of sites say over 1 million lambs were slain on Passover. So think about that. If they worked for 10 hours, that's 100,000 lambs per hour. How many people would it, be, would it take to kill 100,000 lambs? And not just kill them, but to you know, ritually slay them. You'd have to have a conveyor belt for one thing. Several of them with priests and just hacking away at lambs. They would come. It'd be like the I Love Lucy thing in the candies thing. You know, we're like, oh, they're coming too fast, Abraham. You know, I mean, I, I doubt that. Now, why does this matter? Don't, we don't need to exaggerate. Uh, think about what you're saying. People look for any excuse to tell you that they don't want to listen to the gospel. And so it doesn't matter how many lambs they slew. But if somebody says, you told me they killed a million lambs and I found out that was a lie, so the rest of it's a lie too. Ha, <laughs> I'll not get saved. Uh, uh, it's, it's still on them, but let's just be honest about it. Just always be honest about your numbers. Don't fluff. Multitudes of lambs died on Passover. And of course, from the history of Israel, from the Garden of Eden forward, how many thousands and millions, uh, you know, probably uh, certainly over a million by that time. Uh, it was a bloody religion. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Once the sacrifice was complete, there is this acknowledgement of intimacy. The lamb took our place and now they say, God is my God. Wow, that's fantastic. We need to remember that God desires to have fellowship with us. He doesn't need to. He wants to. He draws us into his presence with cords of love and has made a way for us to come back to him. Uh, mankind always wants to make it hard to get to God. But we would say that God has done all the heavy lifting, literally, and wants to have a relationship with mankind. And the whole story of the Bible is that story of redemption. Man fell and God has restored him through Jesus Christ 
He is my God. Mankind lost this intimacy in the garden, but God said he would restore it. He established the temporary sacrifice of lambs until he could come and die himself for us. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And so the psalm ends where it began, with mercy. In a previous study, I challenged you to look up verses regarding mercy, and especially different types of mercy that are described in the Bible. Mercy is new every morning. There are tender mercies. I think that's the phrase that's used more often of of mercy than anything else. And look especially at God's mercy in the lives of uh, characters in the Bible, and like we're doing today in the life of Israel. Mercy is something better seen or experienced than explained. Sometimes we give these quick explanations or definitions. Grace is God's unmerited favor. It's getting what you don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what you deserve. But that doesn't really mean anything. But when you see, when you step back and you think, Israel blows my mind. I don't want to have anything to do with a nation like that. Find somebody who will be thankful and grateful. Uh, I, I delivered you from slavery in Egypt, and now you want garlic? That's what this is all about? Now, I, I'd be in that group. <laughs> Garlic's a pretty good thing. I've never had anything that had too much garlic. It's like Parmesan cheese. It just, you can't overdo it. Just keep it coming. Uh, but, you know, uh, you look at Israel and you think, why didn't God give up on them? Because he's merciful. And then you can look at his law in individual characters. David, the man after God's own heart. What a loser. I mean, seriously. He becomes king. He says, I'm not going to go to battle. and said, I'm going to go rape some lady on the other side of town. And then I'm going to have her husband killed. Oh, my. What happened, David? Uh, I've known people before who think, well, David couldn't have been saved. Well, then you don't know God's mercy. Character after character in the Bible experiences God's mercy. And you know who else does? You and I. We ought to be a lot mellow. You'll mellow yourself out. You want to mellow out? You have an anger problem? Do you go to anger management? You don't understand mercy. You, you don't understand that you, that you don't deserve what you don't deserve, uh, which makes no sense, but I thought I'd say it anyway. It always sounds profound when you say to, to like, it is what it is, you know, and it's like, whoa, wow, I guess it is. Uh, but <laughs> Give me a minute. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for not texting me, by the way. And so mercy, God's mercy is seen. And so look for it in your own life and in the lives of the Bible. God alone is good because of Jesus. He can justify the believing sinner and remain righteous in doing it. It's an amazing plan. It should at least inspire gratitude, if nothing else. Now, you'll notice the word endures is in italics, and that means it's not part of the original text scholars translated from. They added it to make things read better. It should just read, mercy forever. If you're a fan of the MCU, you might remember T'Challa, the Black Panther, sending his forces into battle with the cry, Wakanda forever! And then they go forward and they, they lose that battle, but uh, they, they bounce back in the next movie. But uh, it, it's a great moment. He's up there and he's got all the forces of Wakanda. And he goes, he Bombay! He Bombay! And then he goes, Wakanda forever! And then, uh, so this is our rallying cry. Because Jesus sends us into the fray. And as we go out, he's saying, mercy forever. You know, in some churches you've seen it, they, they have a sign as you're leaving their property or over the foyer door that says, you're now entering your mission field. We should have a sign right now that says, you're now entering the asylum. <laughs> mercy forever will uh, keep you grounded. 